Before we get started, I just wanted to thank you all so much for coming. My name is Leah, and I'm very pleased to be moderating this event today. I first had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Randall Bagley when he came to speak to my crime and punishment class a couple of months ago. Introduced by Professor Joshua Miller, Mr. Bagley seamlessly captivated the attention of the entire class for over 40 minutes as he stood to tell his story. Immediately, I knew that his story was one, alongside so many others like it, that needed to be told in a larger setting than a classroom. Thank you again so much for coming to hear it. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to a fellow Hoya and Georgetown student, Randall Bagley. Thank all of you for coming out. Um, I just spent 24 years of my life in a place where you don't really get to be seen or be heard. So it feels really good to be seen and also be heard, especially when there's so many other things out here that y'all are privy to, to be doing with y'all time. So again, thank you for coming out. Um, 24 years ago, I walked into a house where I thought I was going to rob somebody for some drugs. At the time, I thought going to rob somebody for some drugs was something that I was supposed to be doing. It sounds strange, but where I come from, robbing, stealing, killing, is like a badge of honor. That's how I was raised. That's what I came to understand from the type of music I was listening to, the type of media that I was accustomed to watching. So I walked in the house thinking I was going to rob somebody, and I shot a man, and I killed him. A lot of times when you walk around and you tell somebody that you are or have been convicted of murder, the first thing they said was, but did you do it? So it's hard to look somebody in the face and say, yeah, I killed somebody. Every time it was like, everybody paused and was like, like, what, what do you say behind somebody tell you that they murdered somebody? It's the same thing when you go into a place where you're trying to get a job or just anything when it comes up, like, why you don't have any work history? Why you, like, what's, what's, what's going on? Like, I was convicted of murder. And they immediately just look at you like, you the scum of the earth. And sometimes it's hard to walk around and not feel the same way as if that, what they saying about you is not true. Because sometimes I do feel like that. Uh, being a person who studied different religions, all the scriptures say uh, a man who takes the life of one man is like he took the life of the whole of humanity. So a lot of times it's hard to walk around knowing that the scriptures that I read kind of like say that I'm a bad person. But I didn't come up here to talk to y'all about being a bad person because I'm not a bad person. And what I can't talk to you about is what we call radical forgiveness. And I'm able to talk about radical forgiveness because when I went to trial, and when I went to a modification hearing, the man that I murdered, he had a three-year-old son at the time that I murdered him. 23 years later, his son was 26 years old, and he walked into the courtroom and he told the judge that he forgave me and that he think that I should go home. I deserve a second chance to go home. And it was through the act of forgiveness that I'm able to be here to talk about forgiveness. And the reason why I talk about forgiveness is because it was a long time that I was unable to forgive myself. And the weight of being unable to forgive myself was worse than the weight of the crime that I had committed itself. And a lot of times we walk around all day with the little things that we take and we incorporate into our lives into the way we move around. And then we become to be heavy from just not forgiving ourselves. So... When I was in the courtroom, I told the judge that I asked him if he let me go home because I owed a debt to society that I never made to pay. But I told the judge that I wasn't paying my debt to society in prison, that the only way I could pay my debt to society was in society. So maybe I could say something or be an example for somebody that would stop the next little boy from picking up a gun and robbing somebody and killing him. Or to stop a female from having an illegitimate child and force a little boy to go rob and steal and kill to try to take care of that child. And a lot of times, 
a lot of people don't understand that a lot of times one of them kind of like force the other one. And more times than not, a lot of women think that men are in control. But a lot of times, a lot of stuff that we do as men is to impress or to please or to get a woman. And that was one of the things that was like a defining factor for me, always trying to chase or trying to have or trying to be in a position where I could do something for somebody without putting the work in to be able to do it. And it led to a particular thing. So a lot of times I'd be more eager to talk to the women to understand the power that they possess and how if they understood the power they possess, that they might have the power to change a lot of circumstances because a lot of times men do a lot of things to impress or to please women. Um, uh, like I said, the walk. Everything that I do now is based off of somebody giving me a second chance. So a lot of times I be wanting people to understand that the thing that we might take for granted, you can't really take them for granted because it's so easy to get those things taken away from you when you take certain things for granted. I've been spending 24 years in a cage. I find myself just watching bees pollinate. Uh, I find myself having moments where I just kind of like melt down when I can just turn on or turn off the light switch because a lot of times in prison you're not afforded those simple liberties. So another message that I try to give to the people is to not take anything for granted. You can't take it for granted. We walk around and we students and we get an education and we are afforded these things and we become kind of like complacent with the things that we're afforded as if we're supposed to have those things. And a lot of times that can also lead and become problematic too because a lot of times we begin to look up at what we don't have as opposed to looking down at the people who have our less fortune. And a lot of times when you start to look up, you become ungrateful. And that can also become problematic later on in life when you become ungrateful because when you take things for granted then the things tend to not, you don't give those things the weight that they deserve or they're supposed to have. And a lot of times, like I said, that can be so problematic as well. Um, that's the message that I need everybody to take from what I say. If it's anything you can take from somebody who is a convicted murderer. I am conscious of now the type of music I listen to. I'm conscious of the type of things that I watch. And I really understand that those things do have a burn on how we act and how we move and how we think. And a lot of times we really not conscious of those type of elements. They say, uh, the devil play tricks on you. And a lot of times the devil do play tricks on you through the things that we take into our self, the things we watch, the things we listen to, and just the way we open ourselves up to people that don't really mean us well. And a lot of times you look up and you don't understand that what you're being influenced by, you're doing it to your own self. Uh, I wasn't conscious of it. So I thought that gangster rap and the gangster movie and the gangster lifestyles was a thing that was just something I did for entertainment, not knowing that it was taking, care, taking a part of me and consuming me too. Um, so being in prison 24 years with nothing, I took the time out to begin to educate myself. Uh, I began to read, I began to write. And as I began to read and write, I became more conscious of the tricks or the things that had been deluded into thinking was real things. Uh, and that's why I started off with saying, don't take education for granted. It's like when you're good at it, when you excel at it, or when it's just right there for you, kind of not. Some people don't really give it the type of level of respect that it's supposed to have. I used to talk to a man in prison, and I asked him to teach me something one day. And he was, I'll teach you under one circumstance. And I'm like, what's that? Like, I'm here. I'm, I want to learn. So he reached down. And he touched the floor. He said, I want you to know that you're here. And then he reached up to the ceiling. He said, the education is there. He said, and as long as you understand and believe that, then I'll teach you. 
And at the time, I didn't understand the significance of what he was saying. But what he was saying was just that, that you would have nothing and without the proper education, then it's, you're, you're, it's, it's nothing that you can pretty much have, do, say, or want. It all comes through education. Um, big on education. Uh, it was through education that I was able to, what I consider, fill my toolbox. Coming from the ghetto, for lack of better words, is, or be, lack of better terms, is that you think that you have one form of tool, and that's usually violence. You may need a screwdriver, you may need a wrench, but in the ghetto, all you know is a hammer, whatever you need to be used it on. So that was one of the things that I walked through life, not having the tools to do anything that I needed to do different than use violence or use what you consider street knowledge or street wits. And at the time, like I said, I was deluded into thinking that that, that was a way of life and that was something that I was supposed to do. And it's sad when you walk through life thinking that you're supposed to rob, steal, kill, rape, whatever that you need to do to get by and you think that that's an honorable thing. Still to this day, I don't go to certain areas because it's still a badge of honor. When I go to those places, when I walk to the places, everybody's like, yeah, he, he committed a murder. He got a body. He did all this time. He a G. And I look at him and tell him now, my family, my friends, and tell him like, bro, that don't make you a G. That make you an idiot for real. But it's sad that that's the type of thing, that's the type of lifestyle that we are presented with as a thing. Um... And it's just really not a thing. So I spend a lot of time now sitting around with those same people telling them the same thing, like, bro, it's gotta be a better way. So when I come to what I consider the future of our generation, our nation, it's me really telling y'all and each y'all to understand the power that y'all have, but also to make sure that y'all understand that if we don't utilize the power, if y'all don't utilize the power, then it's gonna keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So you really are the change makers. And you gotta really go into school and education understanding that y'all are the future, y'all are the change makers. And y'all gotta really take into consideration the things that they are giving us as far as entertainment, as far as the social media, as far as all these different, these various outlets that we are using to destroy ourselves but not really using them as a platform that we need to use to make sure that we are the change that we want to see. So, when Leah asked for me to come and talk, I told her, like, I would be, like, overjoyed to be able to say something to somebody if it's only one person that take it and say that I'm going to really be the change that I want to see. A lot of times it's easy for us to sit around and talk about the bad in the world, not really accepting the fact that we can only change the baddest in the world to make it good. A lot of times we want to talk about the bad, but we don't want to be the person or the person that takes charge of changing. So when you go forward, understand that I don't come before you making any excuses for myself. I don't blame my parents. I don't blame my upbringing. What I do blame is my inability to be willing to make a choice because I did have a choice. I dropped out of school in the fifth grade because I wanted to be the cool kid when I did have a choice to go to school. Um, I had my first child when I was 12. I was 13 when the judge told me that I had to pay child support. And he told my mom if she didn't pay child support for me and the child support didn't get paid, then it was gonna lock my mother up. That was at 13, my mother turned to the judge and said, I didn't have a child. The judge said, but you allowed your child to have a child. So I stopped going to school then because my mama said she wasn't paying for a child. So I had to go pay for the child. There's no way a 13 year old can pay for a child. There's only one way a 13 year old can pay for a child. And that was to go in the street and try to sell drugs to pay for the child. So when I say something about illegitimate children, when I say stuff about a woman putting a man in a position to do a particular thing, it was through that thing of me having a child at that age that really started the downward spiral. And in the ghetto where I come from, the same downward spiral. You see a bunch of 13, 14, 15 year old young ladies with two kids, three kids that they can't take care of. And then they go to the welfare system and then they do these things and they do these things. So it really be kind of like a, like a domino effect with that. 
So be mindful of that as well. And um, like I said, if you can take anything from anything that I said is make sure that you understand that you can be the potential change in the world that we want to see. Um, yeah, that's, that's about what you just tell me. Thank you so much, first of all. I know that that must have been extremely hard. My first question for you is, do you think that you would have been able to forgive yourself had that forgiven not come, in, not come from an outside source? No. I was unable to forgive myself. And me being unable to forgive myself also led me to be unable to forgive others. It wasn't until... I began to educate myself through various outlets, reading, writing, that I understood that <clears throat> parents don't come with instruction manuals. I wrote a paper from the Georgetown program called The Needleless Compass. And what it was based, what the, the premise of it was, was that I always blamed my mother for a lot of things. Uh, I watched my mother do drugs. I watched my mother allow her husband to beat her up. I watched my mother allow her husband to uh, molest his children. I watched my mother do all these things. And I also had family in Maryland that was kind of like financially stable. But my mother was so like hell bent for lack of better words to be validated as somebody's husband. It really overshadowed the fact that she was somebody's mother as well. So I didn't forgive my mother. And I didn't forgive myself. So it wasn't until I was forgiven that I was able to understand that forgiving is not just like a one way thing, but it's, I mean, it's not a one way thing, but it's kind of like something that is like you traverse between both ends. So now nah, I wouldn't be able to forgive myself. And how is your relationship with your mother now that you're out of jail? Uh, I might get $75, she wants 70 of it. And she gets 70 of it, I just get $5. She's like, man, I need this, I need that. Uh, it felt so good to be able to give her something. Uh, it felt even better to be able to tell my mother that I forgave her. Um, and she cried and she cried and she cried. And I told her, I said, I forgave her because I never understood that she was doing the best she could with what she had. She was uneducated. She was, that's it, she was uneducated. So the only thing she could do for me was what was done for her. And it's like a perpetual cycle of ignorance that has to be broken. And again, like when I talk to y'all, you gotta understand that there's a cycle of ignorance that be perpetuated throughout society. And it's through you all and through the other decision makers, educated and free thinkers that are able through education to break that cycle of perpetual ignorance. And a lot of times where we come from, we're not afforded that type of opportunity. And I think that I tell Dr. Miller, I tell the Prison Justice Initiative, I tell Georgetown anytime I can how grateful I am that I'm able to do the education that they afford me in prison, to be able to articulate, to be able to go and sit with certain people in certain social settings and kind of like begin to like chip away at that block of ignorance that's been perpetuated throughout society for so long. And it was through that opportunity they gave me that I'm afforded the opportunity to go try to give it to somebody else. And a lot of times, like I said, we get this education and it be on what we can do to build, I mean, to climb the social ladder, the financial ladder. We really go into education and trying to put ourselves in a financial position to just be well off, to be okay financially. But a lot of times there's so much responsibility that comes with this education because there's so many other people that's less fortunate that really need education. So it's through that of giving to those less fortunate that can't afford it that kind of like be balance it out and change something because the people that's poor, they not afford the opportunity. So, yeah. And that cycle that you're talking about, do you see it happening with the generations below you, so your children as well? Uh, I came home, and the first thing I did, I had four sons. I came home, and the first thing I did was I set my sons down. All my sons are in the streets. They're drug dealers. They're what they consider hitters. They gun totals and all that. And I kind of like asked them, could they take me being out of their lives as a template 
or the departure point for change. And they couldn't. Like, all they wanted to do, my sons are, they wanted me to ride around the car with them. They wanted to jump out of the car and tell everybody, yo, Pop's home, he just did a bed, made home, let's no, no, be home. So unfortunately, one of my sons is in prison, I mean, in jail right now, probably facing an exorbitant amount of jail time. Like, maybe a month or two, it ain't been a month. He got in a high speed chase from the police. He hit an old lady, an elderly lady with a car. She's in critical condition right now. And he called my phone like, Dad, I should have listened. I'm like, what are we talking about here, bro? Like, what are we talking about? I just spent 24 years of my life for being ignorant. And then instead of you taking what I tell you as you to learn from my story, now it's his story. And I told him something that he probably couldn't stomach. I was like, yo, don't call my phone and collect no more. Like, you don't call my phone collect. I can't afford to pay for your collect call. Uh, I talked to you when I came out of prison. I told you that if you didn't change the way you would go to prison, and now you're in prison, sit down, get a book, read something, learn something. And my family was like, why would you do it like that? I said, because what we do as a people is kind of like we give people a pat on the back for their wrong to do. And what it does is, I think it encourages them to do more wrong. And I think if I'd have understood before I went in the hardship of what prison is, and it's definitely torture, that maybe I'd have did something different if I'd have really understood that this is really not a place that I wanted to be. So, yeah, my all of my sons. I got a son named Randall Bagley the third. October the second of last year, he shot somebody while he was on FaceTime. Shot him. The guy tried to take his chain. He shot him. And I was in prison at the time. And when I called home, he's like, Dad, he tried to get my chain. I got him. I got him. So he's out on bail, fighting for his life because he shot my own FaceTime. But what hurt me the most was he got on the phone with me and he made it seem as if I was going to congratulate him. Like, I ain't let him take my chain. I'm like, bro, you already spent a lot of time in prison about a chain. So. Yeah, it's a cycle that got to be broken. Where do you think that pride comes from in committing those crimes? Uh, like I said, the music, every time you turn on a song, they talk about you either see a woman with no clothes on, uh, you see these guns now where they have these 500 bullets and a regular handgun, uh, you see all this money that they throw around, you see all these cars. Where I come from, you understand to be able to look up certain statistics. And what I came to find out is that like one or two percent of all people that go into school for sports actually make it to the pros. So what happens in the ghetto is when they don't make it to the pros, then the only way they can really actualize their dreams or this thing that they had in their mind was to try to make it fast. So it's like a trip on both ends. So Moving on to talk more about how life was in prison, I was wondering if you could tell us more about how you felt when your sentence was first announced. The emotions that came around that, was it anger, fear, kind of a mix of both, and how you dealt with that? I wish my lawyer was here to tell you what I told him. Um, he came into the bullpen afterwards. And he said, how you feel? I said, free. I just got sentenced to life in prison. I told him I felt free. He said, what? I said, I don't got to worry about nobody else's bills. I don't have to worry about nobody trying to kill me. I don't have to worry about anything. A lot of things I did, I'm what I consider a cross bearer. Meaning that I would rather give you my money than keep my money. But what happens is that that's a sport of a trick. So a lot of the people I was around understood that about me, that I would really go to the, the depths for the people that I love. My mother exploded it. The females that I had in my life exploded it. So a lot of things I did was really for other people. So when I finally got sentenced to life, I was like, yo, I don't have to worry about nobody else. So it wasn't, oh, I'm locked up. Kind of felt free. So much so that I didn't, I was time barred. I didn't put in for my appeals. I let my appeals evaporate. I was time barred. I really came to the understanding and I really just came to the conclusion that I was going to live in prison and I was cool with it. 
I conducted myself like I was cool with it. Stabbing, fighting, selling drugs, doing all the things that I was doing on the street, I continued to do basically all the way up to the time where I was afforded the opportunity going to Georgetown. Once I was afforded the opportunity going to the Georgetown program, that was the first time in my whole life I felt like I had something to lose. And that's just how I lived. I didn't, I didn't, prison was nothing to me. It was something that I felt like I could do. And I was kind of like, I was bullied when I was young. So being bullied, once I finally fought back and seen the power that I had opposed to the fear I had, I think that drove me. So in prison, it was like I wanted to prove to everybody on the streets and in prison that I could be whoever I wanted to be in prison to. So prison was like a playground for me in a sense. And you said that the Georgetown program is where you first felt that shift. Can you talk more about that and how that started and the impact that it had at your time in prison? Um, prior to Georgetown, I had already been writing, right? I could write. I knew I could write. So I had published like, self-published like three books on Amazon. But I was still going back and forth to lock up. Like I would stab somebody, I would have locked up for like a year. But lockup was the time where I was just out of the mix so I could write, right? So I knew that I could do something, but I always thought I was stupid too. I was like, man, I'm dumb. I was never good at school. So Georgetown was like, when I got accepted into Georgetown, I was like, man, this is kind of cool. Like Georgetown, like, like we, it's Georgetown. So we on the tier, like everybody told me, like, yo, don't apply for that, you got life, you're not getting in. I'm like, man, it's a guy named Reginald Manning. I call him Hamza. He is like my arch nemesis. Like, I would want to beat him anything. I don't care what he got going on with beat him. So he didn't have a typewriter at the time. So the first thing he did, he sent me this essay he wrote for Arizona University. I read it, I said, I'm gonna whoop you on this. So I wrote an essay and sent it. I won the contest, like, beat you. <laughs> so he sent me a um, he sent me a Georgetown thing, but he wouldn't tell me what it was. He was like, I got something to work in. I got something to work in. But what he didn't know, there was an envelope in it. So when I was flipping through, he asked me to type it. I was flipping. I seen the Georgetown. I said, yo, the Georgetown? I'm whipping you. I'm going to get this too. So anyway, <laughs> I rode it and got into Georgetown. And I got accepted. So, man, there was like some rules. You can't do this, you can't do this. We're gonna put you out, and we're gonna do this and do that. And I was like, yo, I was serving life. One thing I can say about the Georgetown program, the Prison Justice Initiative, and the BLA, they started talking about freedom. I'm like, freedom? What's that? I'm like, well, well, freedom is. And that was one of the first things they talked about. So, and it made it seem like it was attainable. And, once they made it feel like it was attainable, then it kind of like was a paradigm shift in my brain. Like, yo, this might be possible. And then they started introducing me to people who cared. Like, when you come from where I come from, nobody cares. They don't care about you. You don't care the dog eat dog world. We can be together today and I'll kill you tomorrow. So I had lost the humanity within myself and I also lost the belief in humanity within other people. So the Georgetown program, the BLA program, and the people that they had brought into us kind of like, was like real people, they cared. And it kind of like all started to come together at the same time. And then like I said, they came and started talking about, man, we're gonna get you out. We're gonna do this and do that. And I kind of like bought into it. And it was a shift. And then once I started to do the work and seeing that I could do the work, kind of like, like man, I was a student after all. And not being stupid and believing in myself kind of like led me to here because that was one of the reasons why uh, the son, his name is Idris, he went to Yale and he had like a 3.3 grade point average or something. At the time when I was in Georgia, I think I had like a 3.8, 3.9. And he was like, hold up, you got a what? So he really was like, man, hold up, you go to Georgia. Like, I couldn't even get to Georgetown, but I went to Yale. I said, all right, cool. But anyway, his thing was, that my grade point average was high to him. And he told the judge, he turned to the judge, he said, Your Honor, you know how hard it is to do that? He's like, this man is serving life in prison and going to die in prison, but he's still dedicating himself to change. And it was a genuine dedication to change because I had no appeals. So Dr. Miller used to say things like, uh, knowledge for the sake of knowledge. And I didn't know what that meant at the time. I'm like, well, let me get it though. 
<laughs> it was just nod for the sake of nod. But it turned out to be a uh, key to my freedom because the judge and Idris and all the people involved, it was like, man, this man is really trying to do something different. And at the time, I finally was trying to do something different. And doing something different, got me really doing something different. Because right now, I could be sitting in the rec hall and with a bunch of other people and just like dying in prison. But instead of that, I'm out I, uh, walking, like really walking. I walk 40 minutes to work. I got a job, I walk 40 minutes to work at 12 o'clock at night and 40 minutes back. But every time I walk down, people be looking at me like, why is this weirdo walking down the street? And the whole time, like, y'all know I've just walked around that record for the last 24 years. Y'all don't think I was weird, but I be just walking. I be skipping to work. They're like, we be kind of happy on this interstate. But like, hey, I'm definitely, it's a different, it's a different thing. What about the process of when you first decided that you wanted to try and fight for your freedom and fight to get out? Did I try? I think the prison definitely still try. Um, I don't think I think they tried, right? I'm like, hold on, let me, did I try? What happened? I, um, my wife, right? Um, she was instrumental in me trying to put an application. She was like, you can do it. It's gonna happen. Mind you, I was just trying to be hands. I didn't really think nothing was gonna come from it. But she was kind of like instrumental in telling me that it could happen. She was really into the church, and she was really faith-based. Faith Even though I was a Muslim, I think that I was more Muslim. I had lost my spirituality over the years. I was more a ritualistic Muslim. I prayed when I was supposed to pray, but it really wasn't the feeling of spirituality where I kind of like believe. It's an Arabic word called tawakal, and it means trust and reliance in Allah. And a lot of times I studied with trusting and relying on God because I never had the ability to trust and rely on any human being. And a lot of times you learn trust from trusting in others. And I was never afforded that opportunity. So I didn't have it, so I didn't trust. But she did. And she kept telling me, like, you're going to get out. And she got an income tax. You know, in the ghetto, income tax time is like, yo, this is like the time you come up. In the ghetto, tax time is like you come up in the ghetto. Tax time is everything. Like, yo, we're going to get a car. We're going to get this new furniture. So with her taxes, she was like, I'm going to pay for your lawyer. I'm like, what? Like, I can't. A lawyer. And that's what she did. But what happened was she prayed for this lady named Beth Franzozo. We were really cool now. Um, but at the time, Miss Franzozo had taken an exorbitant amount of cases. She was taking cases for cheap. And she had all the cases in the jail. Everybody on the tier had it. And my wife paid for a hearing. So Miss Franzozo sent me a brief. She like, look over this. And my wife, like I told you, she's spiritual. My wife said, something ain't right. She said, I got a text a couple weeks ago saying that she already filed this. So why is she telling you to check it? I'm telling you she filed it. So I went into my cell and I got the case number and my, it had already been denied. So we called her on three way. I said, Ms. Franzozo, do you have me sitting here going over a brief that's already been denied? She said, I didn't file a brief. I said, Ms. Franzozo, it says right here clearly filed on your behalf, I mean, entered on your behalf and denied. So I told my wife, yo, hang up on her. Hang up on her. So anyway, Miss Franzozo called my wife back a couple days later. She was like, look, I'm so sorry. And that was an eye opener for me. She said, it took on too many cases. That was an eye opener for me. So she said, tell Randall I'll do 28505, which is the drug program uh, motions. She said, tell him I will do two on for him for free. And I don't know what it was, but I told my wife to call on three way. And when she got on the phone, I said, did you tell my wife that you learned your lesson and that you feel better? She's like, yeah, I'm gonna do better. I said, well, this is what I want you to do for me. I want you to file that same motion. She was like, you can't appeal that motion. I said, Ms. Ranzozo, I found something in my cell that says that they are denying my motion erroneously and it was held sub curve, which is something that you gotta hold. I said, I found the paper. She said, are you serious? I said, I want you to file the motion and send it and say this. And she did. And what's so crazy when I say, this is one thing I tell everybody now, nobody can't tell me about God because I know God is real now. And the reason why is because the motion she filed, the man that got the motion was the person who had 
signed the motion 20 some years ago. He was a judge now, but he was a clerk of court then. So he told the state attorney, he said, you can't tell me about this motion because I'm the one signed this motion. And I was like, what's the odds of that? So it was through my wife. She wasn't my wife at the time. She was like a friend of mine. But I told her, I said, I always used to tell the phone, like, if I ever come home, I'm worried. I didn't think I was going to come home, though. So I was just like, man, just make sure you answer my phone calls and send me some comments or everybody. I was really playing games. I'm like, I'm going to murder you. Just, like, just send me some food on my book. <laughs> so she was sending money and everything. Man, they let me go. I was like, how this going to work out? <laughs> like, yeah, you got to stand on this, right? So I murdered it like two days when I got home, I murdered And it's been my wife ever since. And we just, we just, but... I always think, like, because I don't know what it would have been if she wouldn't have been, like, the belief in me. And she had a seven-year-old son. that all he was three at the time. He was like, you're going to come home and you're going to be rich. <laughs> like, man, both of y'all got more faith in me than me. And I'm home. I ain't rich, but I'm home. So it was kind of cool. So, yeah, it was, I think it was her that kind of, like, really, again, a woman. <laughs> um, during your time in prison, did you find yourself making connections with specific individuals, or was that something that happened kind of later on in the game? In the type of prison, I was in maximum security prisons. I was in ultra max. I was always, I was always. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just like going to just wheel out the door. <laughs> Keep the camera like, bro, if you will any further, there's going to be a ghost in this joint. Okay, so we'll come back this way. Um, in prison, even so in life, like, you have to have somebody in your corner that you can trust. In prison, even more so, because in prison, it's violent, it's a dog eat dog world, and you really can't make it to prison without a genuine connection. Um, I learned that early on. Uh, I, like I told you, I had two friends. At Nansai, he was one of my friends. Uh, and Del Montplay. At Nansai, he was the person that introduced me to his land. Uh, Del Montplay was the one who introduced me to what it meant to be a man in prison. He was like sobbing. And he told me, he was like, man, if you be my friend, then I'm going to have to hold you to a standard and we're going to have to hold each other to a standard. And that's another thing that you really got to take into, into your space. Uh, you got to hold yourself to a standard, but you got to also hold the people that you're allowing to your life to a standard too. And you got to allow them to hold you to a standard. Because a lot of times we take people to our space, but we don't hold them to a standard, and we don't allow them to hold us to a standard. So when, when you hold somebody to a standard, when they fall below, you can tell them, like, look, we cool. But once you fall below the standard and I give you an opportunity to bring yourself up, then I got the right to, to absolve this relationship because we got a standard. And we cool, but I can't allow you to lower your standard in the process you pull me down. And there was one thing he held me to. It was a standard. And he told me, like, bro, do you fall below the standard? And I fell below the standard. And he'll tell me, like, bro, you kind of like, kind of fall below the standard. Like, what's, what's up? And it enabled me to kind of like keep myself at a level of respectability of uh, just conducting myself like a man. And like I said, I was hustling and doing all the things in prison. But to be able to do those things, you got to be looked at as a certain individual. And yeah, it's like, I love my friends. I talk to my, I don't talk to that man as much anymore because that man has got this thing going on. I don't know what he got going on. He got a lot going on. But Delmont player, I talk to him every day. If I get $15, seven of it going on his tablet or his commissary. That's just what it is. That's my friend, and I'm going to keep fighting for him until we get out here with him. So, yeah, friends, standing. Mm -hmm. yeah. How is life now, being out? Free. What do you mean? Uh, is it everything that you thought it was going to be? No. Or, yeah. <laughs> it is not. Uh, Life is 
exactly what you make it. So a lot of times you come into life with these unrealistic expectations of what life is. And what happens when you go into life with these unreal expectations of what life is, you fail to realize that you really have the power to make the life that you want. Life is right for me to make life what I want. So is it how I would like it to be? It is not. But I know that I have some type of control over that. But I learned that through experience. I learned that through being in prison. I learned that through life being taken from me. A lot of times we think life is supposed to be this way. But we don't understand that, again, we have choices. And the choices that we make dictate how our life is. Now, it might have some type of freak accident where something happens that's just out of your control. But a lot of times we have a lot of control over what we do or what we don't do. And uh, so, nah, life ain't what I expect it to be because I know it's still work. I have to work. I still need to finish my degree. I still need to start a business. I still need to invest in stocks. I still need to do a lot of things that I know that I need to do to be where I want to be and to build a legacy for my family and to make sure my wife's son has something to fall back on for himself. So. Life is what it is. It's, it's right for me to make it what I need it to be. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for a few Q and A's, so I'm just going to pass the mic down. Well, thank you so much for coming today. Um, really, we're honored to hear your voice. And my question is, what was the turning point as you began your education? Was it something you read, something you learned, a creative outlet you had? Um, something that uh, inspired you to, to learn? It was really writing, right? Um, I don't know how many of y'all been on lockup in prison, right? So I don't know, but in prison, when you go to prison, you go to something called 23 and one, it's complete isolation. They let you take maybe a book, they let you take a Bible, walk around, paper and pens. So what I did was when I went on lock up to not just go insane, I began writing. I began writing to fill that space. But what happened is I started passing the writing around on the tier. And you might three o'clock in the morning hear somebody laughing, like, like, what are you laughing at? It's like, you're writing. I'm like, it's kind of cool. So I always knew that I wanted to be a writer. And through writing and reading, it helped me to understand that I could time travel through books. So when I was afforded the opportunity to kind of like do something with it, it's like the Bachelor of Liberal, the Bachelor of Liberal Arts program is based off of writing. When you write to try to get in. So it's like, if they gave me a math test, I probably wouldn't put it in the application like that. Yeah, but they gave me a writing and when I wrote. So it was like really people laughing and people recognizing and telling you that, like, you can write. I wanted to ask a question about how does prison ensure so-called corrections? Can you talk about the prison industrial complex and how much, what jobs are available to people inside prison and how much do you earn? And could you talk a bit about how Georgetown's Bachelor of Liberal Arts program in prison um, changed the dynamic and how the existence of that program changed the culture and friendships within prison? And how did it change your perspective on life and your relationship with others? Uh, prison industrial complex. Mm. To me, prison industrial complex just means modern day slavery. Um, I think I was making like 30 cents a day and I was working manual labor. Uh, is another form of slavery. And it's just, that's, that is what it is as far as the prison industrial complex and the money that you make when you're working in prison. They slave you, they don't pay you anything. I uh, got in trouble in the state jail, they sent me to the feds. In the federal system, they have something called Unicor. And you make uniforms, army uniforms, different things like that, but you still get paid pennies. And they you do license plates, you do all this stuff 
and it's really a business. You have people in prison right now in the federal government in prison where they're the operators. You think you're calling four or one operators on the street and it's really ran through a unicorn system in the federal government in prison, but you get paid pennies on a dollar. Um, the culture with prison education, it changed to the point where the BLA program afforded us the opportunity to have everybody in the program on the tier together. And it was amazing. Listen, in prison is a no-no. You can't wear shower slippers in prison outside of your cell. That's like a rule because you might get beat up. So you don't wear them. So when I seen people on the BLA program, the Georgetown program, walk around the shower slippers, we was like, man, we made it. Like, we made it. We made it. And it was like, it changed the culture where everybody was on the tier had a purpose. Uh, I think it's a book like Vogel, Frank Vogel or something. I always mess up everybody's name. It's called uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And I read the book, and at the time I read the book, I really didn't have it in prison. So I take more stock than probably anybody on the tier in the program, even though I'm out. I really like, yo, this is what got me out of prison. And it might get one of my friends out of prison. It might get another man out of prison. So the culture has changed. And like even when we was talking at Princeton, I was like, we need education in prison. Uh, I spoke in Boston at Tufts, and I said the same thing. Like, you have to have prison and education. I mean, you have to have education in prison because without it, you don't really have a purpose. And if you're in prison, you don't have a purpose, regardless of how much time you got. Just like me, say if I wouldn't have learned anything different and the judges have to let me out of prison. You know, still coming right back into society with no tools that I need to navigate throughout this thing. So guess what? I'm right back out here again doing the same thing I was doing. So the culture changes because you afforded the opportunity to do something. And like I said, then it was paying us. The Georgetown program is paying us to go to school. Like the officers was mad. It was like, you get a state check too? Like you get to go to Georgetown and they're going to pay you to go to that? It was like mad. Like the officer was kind of like mad and angry. That we was afforded a chance to get an office, I mean, education. But I used to always tell them, like, what if I don't get education and then I go out there and I rob you when I get back out there because I need some money? So it changed education and prison changed the culture. And I think that's yeah. Talking about how, like, the music you listen to and, like, like what you were, like, intaking influenced your behavior, I feel like a lot of artists who, like, talk about those kinds of subjects sort of justify it by saying it reflects like their experience, their upbringing, their culture, like sort of it's autobiographical. Mm -hmm. So to what extent do you feel like artists are responsible for discouraging behavior that is sort of autobiographical but also, you know, not helping society, not helping listeners, not helping children? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, right? <laughs> I suppose I had a 4.0 GPA, right? But somebody <laughs> back then, I read the note right here, Dr. Miller. Listen, I wrote a paper. He's my philosophy professor. So I wrote a paper saying I hate Tupac Shakur and shoot Tupac Shakur is the reason why the murder rate and the incarceration rate went up. He was like, uh, what, what's the word? It's a word he used, like, you can't prove that. That's, that's like, get it out of here. He get out of here. He just beat my paper to shame. So I'm like... I don't like Tupac. He said, are you serious? You don't like Tupac? So once he seen my face, he was like, you're serious? I'm like, some people can't say what I can say. When I went to go rob, when I went to go steal, when I went to go kill, all of my friends do the same thing. We sit in the car, we listen to Tupac, we listen to some other gangster rapper, we smoke, we drink, and we go act out the things that they act out. A lot of people say it's, Art imitating life. At one time, I might agree with that. But right now, all you see is a bunch of little kids trying to act like the rappers. There's no parental guidance in the house. So we learn from rap music. We learn from rap videos. So one of the things I've been like adding about since I've been home was trying to call the rappers to task. Like, there's a book that I was reading. Uh, I don't know the name of it. But... What they talked about was how uh, the power elite, they take rappers and they give them these exorbitant amount of money and then they let them go out into the neighborhood, go on the TV and they get them to commit crime. 
right? That's what you're getting me to do. If you got me looking at you and you got this million dollar car, this $250,000 chain, you got all these scanty clad women all around you, and you saying that, yeah, this is what's up, but you got all the guns, you got all the drugs. I'm writing a book right now called Black, Gen uh, Black Culture, The Path to Black Genocide. And the reason why I'm writing a book called Black Genocide is because this thing that black people call culture now is a path to mass incarceration and death. And that's why I say it's a really good thing. I'm really passionate about that because I do know that music, uh, the social media, all this stuff, it plays a major role in the crimes that we commit and the way we look at life, the, the misogynistic view that we have of women. Uh, a lot of this stuff comes through music and media. And I'm really, really passionate about that because I do know that it really has a, a, a major impact on crime, violence, and mass incarceration. Um, you've spoken about how education and that sort of rehabilitation allowed you to enter back into society in a productive way. Can you talk a little bit more about like rehabilitative justice as a whole and how that like impacted your experience versus like punitive justice within the first part of your sentence? Um, you know, my, my wife has a child. She's forbidden to beat him. Don't touch him. You can talk to him, but don't touch him. She always like, what you mean? Spare the rods, spoil the child. So I don't know who wrote that, but don't touch him. And the reason why I said don't touch him because I was beat. I watched my mother be beat. I watched other children be beat, and it makes them rigid. And it makes me feel like if you don't do what I say, I'll just beat you. Right? Uh, that's the same way we went to prison. You don't do what I say, you don't give me what I want, I'm going to beat you, or I'm going to stab you, or I'm going to hurt you. Because that's what we taught from children. Do what I say, I'm going to hurt you. But after I hurt you, I'm going to tell you that I love you and I'm sorry. But you do it again, I'm going to hurt you again. This is a cycle of hurt. And we go and we hurt, and we continue to hurt, and we continue to love and we continue to hurt. Right? And the time we love and we hurt, and we never really realize that sometimes I might be going through something. And I might take it out on you. I might hurt you because I'm going through something. You don't even know that you're beating me because you're going through something. You might have let me slide, but because you argued with my dad because you didn't get enough money, then I might just get beat that time. Um, the prison justice system is the same way. Uh, you kill somebody, I'm going to kill you. Right? Uh, you do this thing, I'm going to lock you up for this exorbitant amount of time. No matter, we're not giving you the programs, we're not giving you the education. And you're not going to change. You're just going to warehouse the marginalized people that's already marginalized. It doesn't work. The prison system is going to explode on, implode on itself because you keep locking people up. You're not letting anybody out. I really think Georgetown, BLA, I really think it treats for coming and saying, let me go. But I've been watching over the last year that the system is so overpopulated with people that they have been like doing release vows when they're trying to let the pressure off bunch of old people, 40, 50 years old, can't really do anything. Like, all right, you know, you, you, you're not a threat. But even though I wasn't a threat when I was 25 or 26. So I don't think penalty of justice works on no level. Right? Hi. So, <laughs> yes, so you talked a lot about um, how music and books and media influenced you. Maybe not books, but media influence you in your childhood and led you down a bad path. I'm wondering what things you are consuming now. So like books, again, music, what are you watching that's in this new phase of your life that's leading you to be a better person? Uh, I don't watch TV at all, period. Don't watch it, don't watch it. It's nothing there. The news gives you shock at all. They make you think that we're just all violent criminals and the only thing we do is rob, rape, and kill. No need to watch that. Kanye West, before he went crazy, he used to be one of my favorite rappers. But he always said that I got too many blues for any more bad news. And that was a thing. Like, why do I keep looking at this if you keep making it? All of it is the same thing. They teach you or they indoctrinate you with a certain way of thinking. Um, so I don't watch that. Uh, I don't listen to any type of gangster rap. It's not even allowed in my house. I listen to more cultural music, reggae music, island music, something I really listen to the beats, but you're not going to say, 
the B word and how you killed these people and how you shot him and how you did this and do that, you're not going to say that to me even though I know that you're lying because half of y'all didn't do any of the stuff y'all talking about, which I know for a fact like you guys didn't do that. But I'm also not going to let my son listen to it either because I know what it does. They walk around the house rapping. Look at Instagram. Them little girls is doing all these, you know, six and seven. They twerking and all this stuff. Like, yo, you crazy? Your daughter on Instagram twerking? That's cool. But then when she turned 12 and she get a baby, you feel like it's some type of way. But you told her that that was cool at six. So I, to answer your question, I don't watch TV at all. I don't have time to watch TV. Again, I read. I haven't been able to read stuff at home because I've been so happy to be home. I've just been reading what's going on in the world. Um, I don't let my child listen, my wife's son listen to it. Uh, like I said, I, what, what I've been doing is like talking to other people about my experience and trying to encourage, enlighten, and motivate them to be other than that. And I'm afforded the opportunity to be able to talk to y'all, but I spend more time in the like around people that are actively in the streets, if, if that makes sense. I, I kind of like spend a lot of time talking to them or putting little posts up telling them that uh, you got to stop playing traffic, you're going to get hit by a cop. To let them know, bro, like you got to have, it got to be a better way than you on the corner all day long risking your life and liberty for a couple of hours. So, yeah, that's what I, that's what I do. I kind of like, take what my experience and try to make it other people. I try to paint a good enough picture so they can not have to go through what I went through. And that was my promise to the judge that I was going to try to do that. So that's what I'm doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing that.